Hi, my name is Martin Kurzum. I work for T-Labs and I'm talking to people who think beyond conventions. That is, people who have a different view on technology or push ITC forward, technically or business-wise. Today, I'm talking to Jacob Appelbaum, a well-known security and privacy expert and also a photographer and a journalist. I meet Jacob in Berlin in the Gnome Gallery, where his photographic work is exhibited right now. Whom are you, let's say, fighting against? So what, what's your, what's I mean, your target of your... I wouldn't, I wouldn't frame it that way at all. I'm not fighting against anybody. I mean, I'm fighting for very specific things. The work okay. that we do with the Tor project is to enable people to have fundamental human rights. Of course, there are despotic regimes all over the world and fascists and aspiring fascists all the same that wish to stop you from having those fundamental liberties. But they're not my enemy, they're your enemy and they consider you to be their enemy. That's very different. We're working on building alternative systems that fundamentally encode liberties into the technologies that we use. I don't even need to consider those people in the way that we might frame an enemy. I don't have an interest in that discourse. It doesn't really, for me, it doesn't, it doesn't fit with the way that I think about the world. We want to build positive things. Like with WikiLeaks, one of the things that has been built is an alternative where people have access to the full documents, which means that it's possible to have scientific journalism, mm -hmm. which means when you read an article, you can look at the source documents that explain certain things or that confirm very critical mm -hmm. facts. That is not about having an enemy. That is about being informed. And it's very important to give people information so they can be informed, to engage them in these dialogues, to give them tools to ensure that they're free to do it without, for example, being harmed. Anonymity, for example, gives you the right to read in a very special way, which means you can read without it being tracked to you, without, you know, when you speak, having everything you say being tied to you, where you're allowed to try and to experiment to do new things without it following you around forever. Where, where's the difference between privacy and, and security in your, in your view? I, I think, you know, people call the same thing different things all the time. Um, so, for example, the idea of privacy and the idea of security, it really depends on who you're talking to. Sometimes regular people who don't have any idea about technology, they, they call security technologies privacy technologies. Or you find people who uh, want to spy on you, they call uh, security technologies as privacy technologies and they say those privacy technologies are harmful, uh, to, obviously, to their spying. Um, so I would say that, you know, the way to think about it is to understand that we often use different words to refer to the same thing. But um, in the past, it's true that cryptography played a different role in society. Um, when we did not live in an information age, and we did not live in a world where absolutely everyone carried around something that is the equivalent of a supercomputer of yesterday in our pocket today, when, when that wasn't the case, th things were different. Crypto was used by different people and different actors. But now cryptography is relevant to every single person. And every person, whether or not they know it, is doing massive amounts of computations with their smartphone, for example. Um, they're using cryptography at the very least when they install a package from an app store to verify that it is, in fact, the package that the operating system thinks it should be to make sure that, that it's in fact the correct thing. So cryptography is used all over the place in many different ways, mm -hmm. um, just by really people who just use normal telephones. Even if you don't have a smartphone, there's cryptography used between your, your phone and the towers. It's not very good cryptography, but nonetheless, that's uh, actually mostly telecom's fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but, but I mean, it could be only strong cryptography for example. And we could make it so that when someone wants to attack a user or to spy on them, they can't do it at the places where the cryptography is. And we could make it so that, for example, when you make a phone call, it could just be between those two people. And but the thing we're actually talking about is not really privacy. It's actually confidentiality or integrity. Or, for example, what we're really talking about is the ability for a person to be able to communicate with another person. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. Most people are lazy, convenient, and they prefer comfort, um, and they um, either they don't care or they don't um, uh, rate their, their privacy uh, really valuable, so they, uh, they want the, the servant or the butler to know everything about themselves because it's so convenient. 
I don't, uh, I don't agree that people actually feel that way. I mean, I know why people think that people generally feel that way, but I just dispute it. I think actually everybody, average people wear clothes every day. They, they wear that often for privacy concern reasons. They don't want other people to look at their body or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't go to the gym as much as I need to, so I know for sure that I'm wearing this sweater, which is a little baggier, because that fits and makes me feel better about myself. So that's why I'm wearing a loose shirt. <laughs> I see, okay, right? But I wouldn't say that either of us don't care about privacy, and I wouldn't say the average person doesn't. What I would actually say is that until you have another choice, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to say you don't care and that you don't care about making the better choice, because it's extremely difficult. What is the private version of Amazon? What, what choice are you supposed to make to be able to buy things on the internet in a way where you respect your privacy? Like, how do you do that? What's the payment system, as an example? Forgetting about the website, what's the payment system that respects your privacy? Even something like Bitcoin changes the fundamentals of the privacy. You may be able to do it anonymously, mm -hmm. maybe, if you have the knowledge, but it's not clear to us in the privacy research community, for example, um, I think even how to measure some of these things or how we might determine what they mean. And it's not clear to me, just as a human being, what any of these things mean. But I'm pretty sure that since we don't know that we can't say that people don't care. And if you look at surveys, like sociological surveys, you see that literally millions of people post Snowden-related disclosures, those people have changed their behavior in some way because they do care about their privacy. So I've heard statistics in the tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people that have changed their behavior in some way. Or when surveyed, they say they've changed their behavior, regardless of how they feel about Snowden, regardless of how they feel about WikiLeaks or Laura or Glenn or myself. And so if we just look at that, we, we have to at least maybe consider that we should question that when someone uses Gmail, that means they don't care about privacy. I think what it tells you is actually they do care about privacy and their choice about Gmail may be totally unconnected. Mm. In my case, I use Gmail because I knew the US government would come after me and Google has a very large legal team and so I was able to use Google's legal team as a proxy because I'm not allowed to fight in court with the way the laws are written. And so when they went to Google for that data, that ultimately changed, you know, the, a fight could happen at all. If I had run my own server, they might have just broken in and there would have been no court battle because they do electronic warfare like that. And if they, for example, didn't uh, break in, but if they went to a different provider, a different provider might not have fought for it. So there's like these proxy things that happen on the back end. But if you just simplified it and said, oh, he used Google, he doesn't care about privacy, that would be exactly wrong. Right. And so, for example, we need reproducible builds, we need free software, we need end-to-end -end encryption, we need open standards, and we need all of those things all at the same time, and even then, you still have the problem of them stealing your mail. Not as bad. So you have to become, uh, become or you have to be a Facebook customer to communicate with your friends if they are uh, with Facebook. So, uh, yeah. And that's, um, uh, on the one hand, I would say that's a threat for, for um, an open and, and, and liberal society because you are now not a, not a uh, user of an open, communication system, but you're a customer of a company. That's a huge problem. Okay. I mean, it's a gigantic problem, of course. And it's part of the thing about telephone systems. Telephone systems are an interconnected standard. They come with all the back doors and problems that you could ever wish they didn't, but they do. Uh, that's just the way that it works. But Facebook is a walled garden. And it's not just a walled garden, it's a communications prison, mm -hmm. right? And that is the problem, is that you know, they don't have open federated systems, they don't have systems that are decentralized, they don't have distributed systems in the sense that we would like them, or that I would like them. And of course, that's a huge problem. You would never use Tor to log into Facebook, right? That, that, would, that, that wouldn't make sense. Well, I don't use Facebook, so that's <laughs> no, different. But I think you, you wouldn't recommend this to, to use Tor to log into Facebook. Or would you? I think everybody has to make their own decisions. And I think that if you think about it in one way, the obvious answer is, oh, why would you use Tor to connect to anything on the internet, right? I mean, why do you use the internet at all? But Tor is also part of a harm minim minimization strategy. So to give an example of what I mean by that, you, for example, if you eat food that has, like, like you have cholesterol, and you already have high cholesterol, right? And you're worried that you're eating, I don't know, let's say you eat too many eggs or something like that, right? I mean, it's like, if you say you care about your health, yeah, you might still do that. Why is that? And, and part of the reason is, like, you want to enjoy your life. You want to be able to eat things that someone else has made for mm -hmm. you. And you mentioned your wife. So your wife makes, like, what, like, makes something with eggs in it or whatever. You're not even allowed to say no in that point, right? <laughs> She's made it for you, and if you say no, she, there's social consequences. 
So a lot of people there on Facebook, but why not use Tor to access Facebook? Facebook supports explicitly using Tor, actually. Um, but another important point about this is that you reduce the information Facebook has. You literally have given Facebook no information about your location. You, have you heard, I think you probably have heard about this right to be forgotten, which is um, discussed at least in, in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about this um, um, term and about the, 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 the reality behind it? Well, I think that it's uh, interesting, to say the least, that, you know, for most of the data protection and privacy laws, in theory, any data that is stored about you, you're allowed to see it and to correct errors. Now, I think the right to be forgotten goes significantly further than that, but it's interesting to note that the right to be forgotten is being applied to censor things like Google, mm -hmm. uh, and it's being used to censor stories about Google being censored as well. So mm -hmm. they're trying to use the right to be forgotten to erase stories about people using the right to be forgotten to erase a thing about which they wish could be mm -hmm. forgotten. Mm -hmm. That's really complicated. And it's a little concerning to me because it's clear that like any attempt to censor the internet, that there are some serious downsides, even if there might be a good reason. Um, but I tend to think the right answer is to not erase information um, from history. Would it make more, make more sense to uh, change um, the, 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 the value and the, uh, of um, the, these old and mistakes? So maybe not, not a right to be forgotten, but a kind of right to, uh, um, to be forgiven? I mean, sure. I, I mean, I, I have long been interested in a thing called the Eternity Service. Um, it's a thing that Ross Anderson uh, theorized, and it would be the ability to publish things um, and really actually to have them live on forever. And so this is sort of the exact opposite of the right to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. But I like the idea of being able to publish things that cannot be unpublished. Um, in particular, I would love it if it was impossible for kings and queens the whole world over to not erase things that they find inconvenient. You know, um, like it, it would be important, for example, to show that there are things that we've learned in human history mm -hmm. that even if a very powerful and important person wants to get rid of them, that they can't, no matter how powerful and important they are. And the internet changes fundamentally a way to, of doing that in terms of the economics, but it's mm -hmm. still the same, like, right, the, this panda to panda here, it's an arc of knowledge. Even if you destroyed the whole internet, the pandas control uh, nothing. They're not important in any way, but if you go to the panda, you can receive this knowledge from the panda. You'd have to open the panda up, obviously, and take the, the SD card out of it. But that arc of knowledge is a thing which intentionally, in this case, was made analog and digital, right? It's digital in a sense because it's a, this SD card, but it's analog in the sense that it's this physical object. It's a stuffed panda. And the Eternity Service was an idea by Ross Anderson essentially to create that, but on the internet as well. So to create like a peer-to-peer -peer system where you needed an anonymous communications channel. And uh, Roger Dingledine wrote about this in his uh, thesis at MIT, um, the Free Haven Service. Um, and these, these kinds of crypto systems are in some ways the exact opposite of the right to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. And I think that once we accept that this information often is around for a very long time, we do need to think about and what we will do now. What, what, mm -hmm. what shall we do now with this information? And what will we do in a world where this information exists? Like how, how, how will our lives be impacted by it? Mm -hmm. And of course, it should be the case that things that you've done in the past should not haunt you forever. So, so I think we need to be careful about getting what we wish for in that regard, because we may just end up in a world where we're not allowed to know what mm -hmm. actually exists. Yeah. What is Tor? And maybe a few numbers, how, how big is Tor? And uh, what, what is it? The Tor network is an anonymity network or privacy and security relating network that it helps you to stay private and secure and anonymous on the internet. And it is, um, it's used really by millions of people every single day. Uh, it's made with free software, and it's both a piece of software you install on your telephone or on your computer, and also a network that you connect to. It's like a virtual private network, um, or you could think of it as it's like using a mail system where you send things, but instead of having the return address, you would have like a postal system that would receive your mail and know where to forward it. So it's, it's a communication system generally. You can use it for browsing the web, for chatting with people, for connecting to Facebook, whatever you actually need to use it for. And it also helps to fight against surveillance. So if someone is monitoring your internet connection 
and they like data mine it. Like they want to see if you're going to like a dieting website, for example, or you're going to a dating website, or you're doing something on the internet. Um, they'll look at the data, this is called clickstream data, and they'll extract data from it. And if you use Tor, what they'll see is that you're using Tor. They will no longer see that you went to go look up a recipe for pancakes. They'll never know the thing that you're actually um, doing. They'll only see that you're using Tor. And so Tor is meant to give you privacy, and also it means that you get to choose what information you release. So you can use it and go sign up for Facebook. Also, when you want to, you can choose what information to give to Facebook. Facebook otherwise would know where you're coming from, so the city you're in, potentially the language you speak, and a bunch of other details. And the Tor browser is designed to give you that without any elitist knowledge. You don't need to learn how to configure anything. You don't need to learn how to do anything. You just need to use the piece of software and then connect to services that offer secure ways to connect to them. Especially those officials, they say that's a dark net. Um, in the dark net, there are only, uh, you, um, you can, of course, uh, uh, connect to Facebook, but usually you, uh, you connect to some other uh, uh, Silk Road services, buying weapons or drugs or uh, performing crimes. But if you want to buy drugs, you go to Golitzer Park, and if you want to buy <laughs> guns, you go to Heckler & Koch here in Germany, right? I mean, these are insignificant numbers in terms of economies. They really are, as far as we can tell. Um, it's true that people will be able to do all kinds of things more privately, but this is the point. The internet is a reflection of human society, and Tor is, of course, on the internet. So it is the case that people use anonymity for things that you know, you might think are bad. For example, police officers that commit acts of police brutality against protesters, let's say protesters who are trying to work on environmental issues, those police officers who beat up those protesters commit acts of violence against them, they might also use Tor. Okay. That's how it goes. Sometimes yeah. bad guys, they, they use technologies that regular people need to protect their privacy because they're regular people too. Mm -hmm. Taking away their ability to have privacy actually only harms everybody else. It doesn't usually harm them. People that are willing to break the rules, they're going to get privacy. What we want is to make it so that everybody gets privacy without having to pay for it, but instead they can help run the network. They can help improve the network. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer network, which anyone can participate in. You can use the network to browse the web, for example, or you can be the network in the very literal sense. You can be one of the nodes in the, in the very large network that exists. And there are, um, but for example, there exists a thing called Signal and another thing called Redphone. They're the same, essentially where we can call each other and it's end-to-end -end encrypted. Mm -hmm. And even if someone intercepts it on the network, they can't make sense of it because it uses what are called ephemeral keys, which is to say that we've made this communication between us and when we end the call, it actually destroys the keys that make sense of the information. Mm -hmm. Because all that mattered was the information transferred between our heads. So we can have this. So uh, Telecom also has another system which is uh, called MeCrypt, for example. I have that installed on this phone as well just to test it out. Um, it doesn't work by default if you're a telecom customer. You have to pay extra for it. So this is a, another kind of strange thing because actually every telecom user in the world could have that by default. It's necessary to, to run the network to be under, un, uh, in control. And so if you give away this control to the end customer, uh, it's much more difficult to, uh, to, to run the red network. I don't think so. No? No, I don't think so. I think what is more difficult is that it's harder for them to betray their customers, actually. That's the difference. Because a stream of data that is 128 kilobits or, you know, 7 kilobits of data or whatever streaming from the phone to another f device somewhere on the internet, this is not hard to control. It's not hard to control in the sense that you can, like, make sure that those calls are of a high quality, that the data gets there in a reasonable time and all that. You don't need to know the content of my call to do that. And in fact, it is a liability. It's a data liability when you do. And in fact, what happens is telecom becomes a secret agent of the state. And also, as, as an activist and journalist, you um, influence politics to, to move forward to, um, let's say, promote and, and, and change, promote uh, the, the idea of liberty and uh, change the world uh, uh, in, in the positive direction to um, achieve more, more liberty to the, to the single person. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think that that's accurate, but I guess one thing I would say, I don't really like the term activist because it makes me feel like participation is rare and that it's somehow special and often it's used pejoratively. 
And the work that we do with Tor is about liberties that everyone has and every single person can be a part of it, right? So we're here talking about telecommunications. That doesn't make you a telecommunications activist, right? <laughs> to be engaged with society uh, is, is uh, in my opinion, what should be the normal thing. We should consider ourselves and we should consider our role in the world and also we should think in a long-term way. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, in San Francisco, there's a group called the Long Now Society and they advocate people write dates uh, in 10,000 year terms, so the year 0, 2001, for <laughs> example. And the idea is to promote long-term thinking mm -hmm. because actually the choices that we make now, they're not just about ourselves, they're actually about like, you know, our children's children's children. Mm -hmm. So what kind of world do we actually want to create? And I think that to do that, you need to do it in multiple areas if you can. So you should potentially participate in whichever ways you feel competent to do so. And I think technology is an important aspect of that, but you need to use the political systems that exist today often mm -hmm. to change things today and tomorrow. And you need to deal with culture because culture is part of perception. So for example, when you say, oh, I don't think people care about privacy. Some people say that. And why do they feel that way? And that's because the culture around us echoes that. But it's maybe not representative of what people feel. So let's change the culture around us because that will change the ability for us to interpret people. What would your advice um, to the average person? I mean, I, I, uh, I think sometimes reform is the correct choice, but often I think that um, revolution is a better choice. So for example, <laughs> you don't reform a drone strike agency. But, but for big companies, if for example, Deutsche Telekom, so um, what, uh, what should they do with, uh, um, to, uh, to provide more, more privacy? And to, should they um, uh, ask for uh, laws to, uh, to, for, to, to force them um, providing encrypted? I mean, I don't actually, I actually don't want them to be forced to do that because forcing them to secure your communications is not so different than forcing them to backdoor your communications. And I think that that would also be wrong. Um, but I do think the important thing to remember is that inside every company is a repository of documents. And that repository of document tells a story about the history of that company. So the thing that people that run those companies need to remember is someday we're going to have those documents. Mm -hmm. Make sure they say what you want everyone to know. From, only from a cutthroat capitalist perspective. Do the right thing, because we're coming for your documents. <laughs> okay. What are your next steps in the next couple of months, weeks, years? Um, where, where are you uh, heading? I'm actually I started a PhD in post-quantum computer cryptography. So I'm going to spend the next five years studying with uh, Dan, Dan Bernstein and Tanya Long at the University of Eindhoven mm -hmm. to kind of work on crypto systems, practical, deployable crypto systems that will help people to thwart surveillance for the next, you know, 100 or 1,000 years. Okay, I, I wish you luck and I wish all the best for your studies in uh, post-quantum cryptography. That's we'll see. interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. Great. Thank you.